Uh, no, no, I don't see your screen. Sorry. I think we are we are we are alive now. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, okay. Nice, 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 man. So uh, here we are uh, once again in Paitata Salamanca. Uh, so just to let you know, uh, we are gonna we are gonna have uh, today Manas Gaur. And Manas Gaur is a friend of mine, and I'm I'm gonna be a little bit biased uh, presenting him, but uh, I'm honest too. He's a great person, and uh, he's a he's a PhD student uh, at the Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, the University of South Carolina in the U.S. So Manas and I we were part of the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship in 2017 that uh, um, took place in, in Lisbon. It was the first European edition and we shared a lot of time together. But uh, he is also uh, a great uh, machine learning uh, researcher. He is specialized mainly in knowledge graphs and he's gonna talk about knowledge infused learning today. And um, he's, uh, but uh, he's also uh, specialized in natural language processing and also machine learning. But mainly, he he focuses on applications to solve uh, social good problems in domains such as mental health, fever, social harms, and crisis response. But uh, most important of that, he is a basketball lover, as I am. And yeah. speaking about basketball, uh, so. This is a little spoiler, but in two weeks we will have uh, a professional basketball player, Sergio Olmos. Uh, he will uh, speak a lot, a lot, but he happens to be also a statistician. Uh, he, he does uh, statistics analysis in basketball and sports in general. And he just retired and uh, it's, he is going to give us a talk. Uh, about how we can analyze uh, basketball uh, data. So if you want to see this presentation, it will happen in, in, in two weeks. But I, I stop talking about that. So for the, for, for the people that are joining uh, uh, far away from Spain, just to let you know where Salamanca is, Salamanca is a little city between Lisbon and Madrid. Uh, we are uh, mainly near the border. Manas couldn't uh, visit Salamanca when we were in Lisbon, but he will he will do as soon as possible. I know Manas after COVID. Yeah, after COVID. So <laughs> uh, but uh, so we we want people to to give presentations. So if uh, some one of the speaker of the the people that are watching the the video is interested in giving a talk, just contact us. And just that's that is all. Uh, so, Manas, once you are ready, uh, we are willing to to learn about knowledge infused learning. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, University of Salamanca for hosting PyData and our moderator, uh, Dr. Victor, uh, for giving us such a nice introduction about me and our mutual fondness in basketball. So, uh, yeah. First of all, like before I start the talk, let me just start our conversations with a very specific question, which we as a data science, as an artificial intelligence person, we more often encounter, which is why uh, AI's adoption in real world, particularly in healthcare is so challenging, right? Why there is, has been some issues. So when I say healthcare, we talk about electronic health records. We talk about social media, Twitter, Reddit, which has been like, Overload, overloaded with a lot of conversations in healthcare. People seeking help, people providing help. And apart from that, we also see frameworks uh, which have been used on these platforms for healthcare. Uh, for example, you can talk about conversational systems, making chatbots for healthcare, right? Uh, as Victor just said, in subsequent down the line, you will have one conversation, one talk on the COVID-19 chatbot app. Apart from that, you have deep learning systems as well as recommendation systems. So one of the things that uh, we share in common, uh, Victor and my, me, is 
uh, we had this work in data science by social good where we were trying to relate uh, um, uh, patients and clinicians through our recommendation systems and where we actually exploited the hierarchy in ICD-10, which is the International Classification of Diseases, 10th edition. So uh, they're like, this is basically that whole area where we actually look at the healthcare and the challenges are still alive that uh, why, uh, why basically the AI's adoption in uh, healthcare uh, is still challenging. And in this presentation, I will be walking through you a, a series of work and applications which me and my colleagues have done particularly in healthcare uh, with the whole goal of involving the background knowledge. And when I say background knowledge, they can be graph, it can be human in loop, or it can be simple uh, kind of a lexicon or kind of a dictionary that you use to actually motivate your, uh, uh, your uh, research and actually helping your deep learning algorithms to work better. So our outline of the today's talk would be twofold, very specific on motivation so first of all i will be motivating you on the knowledge infused learning we'll, i'll be providing some concrete definitions uh, how do we use knowledge graph in uh, in applications uh, providing a little mathematical background i know it's some it's late in salamanca and uh, but i can it's kind of a light lightweight mathematics and not too much in details uh, I will be talking about some kind of types of knowledge infused learning. Like what are the different types that we came up with, different categories of knowledge infused learning. And the five, fifth point, which is pretty essential and would be the key takeaway, uh, would be the models, evaluation methods, and applications. So, where they have been used, or they are they are like there are some other areas where there's a which hold potential for uh, knowledge infused learning. And then I will talk about the knowledge infused learning. For healthcare, providing giving you the some of the challenges that my myself encountered in the data sets, and a, a project which actually I worked on bridging the gap between Reddit and DSM-5, where I say DSM-5 it is a diagnostic and statistical manual for mental health disorders, which is basically a, a kind of a holy grail for the clinic uh, clinical psychiatrists. So this is something that they often use in order to treat their patient. So just wanted to see how we can actually map Reddit and DSM-5. So moving on further, uh, let's have a definition for the knowledge graph. What do we, what is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph is basically a structural representation of knowledge. Uh, let's say we have uh, less in a very simple sense, we can think about apple as one of the uh, concept. And then there's red apple, there's green apple, and there is like orange apple, or there are like different colors of it, different categories, something very similar. You have the purse or you have this, uh, let's say a kind of a concept and there are different variants of that concept that act, are actually related to that main concept. So you kind of do a hierarchical representation, which is more like a structured knowledge. Uh, and it, and what it happens is that it, it occurs in Wikipedia. You When you open a Wikipedia on the right hand side, you have this info box, which provides all the details, all the different concepts and the values of that. So those are like the, you can say those are the visual representations of knowledge graph. This knowledge graph actually helps you, uh, and there are series of work on this in the past on semantic browsing, personalization, recommendations, uh, because you want to do a personalized recommendations. One of the thing that Netflix does it uh, based on the reviews and your comments. Uh, Amazon does it. YouTube also has it because based on your uh, keep on uh, watching some particular video, it kind of learn and also recommend you some things very similar in content uh, and the summarization. But more importantly, the knowledge graph's role lies on solving two very specific problems, which is data sparsity, because not all the domains, not all the problems in healthcare specific have a very nice curated data. That's the biggest challenge. And data sparsity is one of them and ambiguity. And ambiguity comes as kind of an occupational thing where when a person, when a clinician is interacting with a patient one and a patient two, they might be suffering from the same disease but they are explaining themselves in a different way. So here is the lies ambiguity, which our brain solves it based on the background knowledge that we have, but uh, how we can actually use that kind of a structure, uh, that kind of a mental model in solving some real life problems is that's one other challenge that is raised by, uh, that is basically highlighted by me as considered as uh, ambiguity. So that's another challenge where actually knowledge graph plays a key role. So there are different forms of knowledge graphs in specific. One is ontology, 
When I say ontology means I have a graph, I have a knowledge graph, and a human um, uh, person or a human or a domain expert curates the, its entities and relations. So I know that whatever is present in, uh, in the graph is validated by humans. Another is a knowledge base, which is a flattened graph, and you can consider them to be a relational databases. So I'm using a relational databases. For example, uh, let's say I, I make my model, which actually simultaneously in parallel queries a database, gets some additional information, uh, adds that, in, augments that information to its current stage or current uh, procedure, and it tries and it improves its learning. So it's uh, getting, getting, is gathering more information and more knowledge from the relational databases. That's another knowledge base. Lexicon, which is another version of our knowledge graph, which is also a flattened one, but it is very application specific. You create it for a very specific application where you want to use it, and it is not generalizable across different applications. For example, if I wanted to create an anxiety related lexicon, which is the most common and common uh, cause of, or issues in COVID-19, uh, anxiety lexicon is there. So you can actually create one of them or you can create a depression lexicon very specific to understand the depression trends in COVID-19. Uh, there are general purpose knowledge graph, which is humongous and you, which you can use uh, just to uh, filter your content and make it more specific. For example, DBpedia, which is a uh, graph of Wikipedia, Yago, Freebase, ConceptNet is a multilingual knowledge graph, uh, which have been developed by MIT Common Sense Lab. And it has, it's kind of a kind of a spin off from the, from the MIT Media Lab uh, research. Then you have Knowledge Vault. Nell is a never ending language learner uh, hosted by CMU and Wikidata, which is another curated form of the general purpose knowledge. So you get your information about elections. You talk about information about epidemic, pandemics. You can talk about disaster scenarios or so all those informations are present in these knowledge graphs. So when you're dealing with those problems, these are the general purpose knowledge graphs that you, you can actually leverage to improve your deep learning uh, procedures. Now, we, when we talk about healthcare, there are very specific knowledge graphs. Uh, sorry. So the first one is the SNOMED CT, which is basically the nomenclature, unified uh, medical language system, which is uh, kind of like, uh, which is another relational databases providing the concepts, uh, treatment, diseases, procedures, uh, findings, as well as symptoms. DataMate uh, is a basic an API made by uh, uh, NIH and University of California, San Diego. And I have given a link to the, in the bottom of the presentation to how we can actually, you can access it. It's a very fairly accessible API, but requires some kind of like a filtering at the top of it. ICD-10, RxNorm, which is basically the drug related database. Uh, and it can be, it, it's also a knowledge graph because they are actually converted into some kind of entities and relations and subject predicate and object triple kind of thing. So where you have the subject is one of the disease and object can be the symptoms and uh, the relationship is can be uh, defined by the uh, domain experts. So the drug bank and drug abuse ontology and medical dictionary for regulatory activities. So these are like the more very specific knowledge graphs which have been used in uh, the healthcare. Some of them I have used by myself as well as I go through in the subsequent slides. Let's take an example of how these look like. So on the very left is a common sense reasoning graph made by Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence, which tells you that if you have any, any uh, statement where X repels Y attack, what are the different ways you can actually express it? In the middle is a drug abuse ontology, which talks about how people express themselves, uh, uh, especially people who are suffering from drug abuse issues and addictions on social media, and how uh, we can actually use the uh, domain experts knowledge along with the uh, native language these people use in social media to actually make an understanding of how we can express them and how we can understand what exactly they are facing from and what are the diseases and how they're expressing whether they are the people who are addicted they are whether the people who are actually having some uh, uh, hallucination because of they are taking some sedatives how what are the, their behaviors actually is we can actually express from this ontology and the third one is an event ontology, which is also created using the uh, cognitive uh, 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 theories, as well as it's a kind of the, it, it is basically built on the Levin's um, uh, categorization of events. And it's pretty interesting to see how these events are being linked to each other. And you can actually use these ontologies to actually make your data, your, your basic structured data in healthcare records, you are, are basically your data in the social media, make it more meaningful using these ontologies. 
and the third fourth one is basically the crisis ontology which how which express like for example a, a person a person is talking about affected population is one of the tweet that is coming there what are the next possible tweet that should be associated with it people will ask for volunteer support people will ask for service uh, uh, people will report trapped people people will uh, will show about missing peoples so these information if you are ac uh, accumulated together and summarize them it will be helpful for the end user especially the domain uh, the domain expert which is the emergency responders to get a better decision of the a better understanding of the situations so the, our another example where we can actually use this knowledge graph is the personalization which is a very fascinating thing uh, specifically in covid-19 as well as in mental health care because when you say personalization means we are actually giving a decision based on the data that you are giving me then which is very interesting because that's uh, that's uh, that would require uh, a very extensive use of the knowledge graph the reason is because over here as you are playing with the chatbot chatbot is gathering your information making a graph so that next time when you interact with the chatbot you are able to get meaningful information and your conversations is more like it's is not like a kind of a uh, uh, kind of a question answering system is more like a conversation like a dialogue flow so now the here challenge where a uh, current uh, chatbot have is without personalization without personalized knowledge graph it gives a very uh, very generic information but with a knowledge graph it is more meaningful because it is able to understand what you are actually asking and related with one of the information being present in the database and so that it can give you a more specific information or more and like even it's kind of like a you can consider it like a reinforcement learning system where you user gives an in input the system realizes that input give a more generic output more understandable output and so, and uh, actually the conversations happens so this actually brings in user engagement because then the concept of reflective listening which is one of the major uh, parameters in the clinical setting comes into play now another application where we have used knowledge graph in a very recent work is assessing the mental health impact of covid using new using news articles so what i essentially did in this work was we act, I actually uh, actually brought together all the uh, news articles around the globe using the gdelt database now this language this uh, this uh, news articles are in multiple languages we used a multilingual knowledge graph as i said in the previous slides a concept net knowledge graph and that knowledge graph converted this uh, uh, all the languages into english maintaining the semantics then we used an off the shelf neural parsing uh, mechanism with self attention which is basically a parser an nlp parser to actually extract three very critical things verb phrases which describes the events preposition phrases which describes the intensity of the events and the noun phrases which are just candidate entities and this is to uh, consider this to be a very huge a large set of uh, information now what we did was we passed this information through dbpedia to set to find those entities which are actually understandable by people right we actually use dbpedia as well as umls which is the unified medical language system to identify those entities which are either related to healthcare directly or indirectly they are related to healthcare so that's comes that forms a filter set of entities now we categorize these entities by states you can act for that you can actually use another ontologies or you can actually use on of the shelf uh, uh, some of the uh, apis which are there available to actually find what are the different states and in in this thing what we did was we actually looked at the states mention in the news articles and that's how we categorize them and we filtered this set of entities using phq9 and dsm5 lexicons because we wanted to be very specific to mental health and it is very hard to go very specific to mental health in dbpedia and uh, umls because they are general healthcare systems and on general purpose knowledge graph to be very specific that's why we use phq9 and dsm5 lexicons and i said before lexicons are very specific to applications and then we actually looked at the different uh, trends in the first week what happened in the second week what happened third week and fourth week uh, of uh, uh, i think this analysis was actually done for the period of march uh, for, for a few weeks of march and the fun first few weeks of april so that's how the analysis was actually done because that was the dominant phase when uh, when uh, when uh, covid-19 what is was at hike what is at what uh, was at a rise in uh, uh, usa in major part of the states
Another work that we actually did where we utilized knowledge graph was to understand the gender based violence. So when the gender based violence is you can consider that to be a causative agent, a causative uh, phenomenon uh, of mental health. And particularly we did it for Twitter conversations. So what we essentially did was we actually leveraged a gender based violence lexicon. We mapped that lexicon through to DBpedia and then we filtered it. Based on, and, and then we looked at some of the categories which are relevant to those terms. We organized this lexicon based on the categories in the gender based, uh, so using the words in the gender based violence lexicon. And then what we essentially do is we calculate a cosine similarity between two vectors one vector from that lexicon and one vector from the tweets that are being uh, dispatched or that have been published on Twitter from the, for the period of March 14 to April 4. And then what we essentially do is we actually create a gender-based violence index where we have a tweet and its score or to the what level it, the gender-based violence is being present in that tweet. And then we use a maximum a priori uh, estimation uh, algorithm, which is a map algorithm, which is pretty interesting because we have, uh, and the reason I wanted to do, we, we used MAP and not MLE was because MAP is very specific to the problem that you're using. And it only works on the observed data and not on the unobserved data. So right now we just wanted to focus on the gender-based violence only in COVID and not any other domain. So that's why we only focus on map estimation. So we did an estimation for 14 days and which you can see in the lower end, there's a plot. So where we actually saw that uh, before March 14, the gender-based violence was nearly 5%, but during the COVID-19, uh, during due, due to multiple uh, uh, events that are happening, it rose to 58%. So with all these knowledge graph related activities and the knowledge infused uh, involvement in deep learning, let me give you a very concrete definition of what I meant by knowledge infused learning. So knowledge infused learning is the exploitation of domain knowledge. This domain knowledge is in the knowledge graph, can be knowledge base or can be human in loop and application semantics. Basically, we want to preserve the semantics in every transformation that we do uh, on the data and with the uh, with the holding that we improve the deep learning methods by infusing this knowledge by infusing relevant conceptual information into the statistical and data driven computational approach and which um, we which is basic kind of analogous to uh, a kind of a buzzword which is neurosymbolic ai right where you actually bring in the symbolic information in terms of logics and rules uh, which are there in the domain in the knowledge graph and the neural processing which is given by the deep learning algorithm so this forms the whole crux the whole definition for the knowledge infused learning now why actually as i said in the very beginning we have the data sparsity issues and ambiguity issues but apart from that the major issue that actually drived my attention to knowledge infused learning was probably approximate correct learning which is a packed learning it's a very old phenomenon uh, uh, around like 1994, 1985, and revised by Dr. Les uh, Leslie Valiant in his recent work on robust logics in 2000. So back learning uh, says that uh, this, the, in the real world data, you have uh, the real world uh, training data is humongous and it is computationally uh, hard to actually find the area where you can actually get the best outcome of your model. So in this equation, if can you and if I wanted to make an understanding of it is you want your test error to be acceptably good, like uh, so uh, and you want the training error to be as close to zero. The number of hypotheses that you will be generating in order to achieve the state is exponential over the number of samples that you are putting on your training sample on your training uh, in your training uh, model. So the exponential number of samples that you are actually uh, taking, that makes this entire process computationally hard. And there are many turnarounds, there are many uh, 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 relaxation that you can do. For example, you actually minimize your misclassification error. You say that, okay, let's say 0.2 is sufficient for me, 0.4 is sufficient for me. That's kind of like a kind of a, like, you can actually relax that kind of thing. And you can also put an empirical threshold, which is a human annotation error. Like what is the error that human will often most probably will do. You use that to actually reduce your uh, training times and you also reduce your search space. So those are like the uh, things that you actually work around to actually minimize your training times. But essentially this pack learning does allows you to do 
following. It will tell you whether the trained data provides a good domain coverage, whether the model trained is a robust, having a low generalizability error, and it is a consistent classifier. That means it has a low training error. And what it tells, it tells what you can actually get from this, which affects, which helps you actually in getting your system out in the uh, real world is confidence and complexity. You have more confidence on your on your models because th that's how it is being evaluated. And the complexity means the less complex is the model, the less number of samples that you will require to train. The more complex your model is, the more number of samples you will require to train. So that's a trade-off. And it is often seen in the deep learning uh, paradigm. So this pack learning behavior actually helps you to give you a, to develop a model which is actually will help you in uh, evaluating your data, evaluating a model, and seeing its visibility in real world. Uh, let's, uh, in this knowledge infusion process, uh, what essentially uh, when we 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 when we are looking at the pack learning, so pack learning is just talking about the this uh, motivation that this data set is. Uh, uh, you are actually trying to. Uh, 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 what you can say that uh, you are actually trying to reduce uh, the complexity of your model. You're you're trying to make it more generalizable. Essentially, the biggest challenge that uh, pack learning highlights is the association between the true data distribution and the hypothesis data distribution. Hypothesis data distribution is the distribution that your model learns, and the true data distribution is your true data distribution is basically the the data that is there in the real world. Or that on which your model is training existing models existing machine learning model what they do is you, you give this you give your data d to your model it will learn a hypothesis distribution by minimizing the uh, the distributional difference between these two the challenge lies when the labels that on which your model is training is not zero and one but there are some labels developed by the human annotators by, by using their own knowledge if that happens it is very hard for the model to actually achieve a certain level of accuracy. And that becomes the biggest challenge in, in its adoption. Infusion on the other hand will help you out in trying in, in putting a gap, in actually bridging the gap between the true data distribution and the concept, which is based on or the target variables on which uh, your data is, uh, uh, or, or basically the target variables which actually use, uh, which are used to actually create your data and it tries to convert this entire complex of dx and cx into dx and cx are converted into you like are basically there's a gap between these two and based on some empirical threshold you give your output level as zero and one and this entire process again falls into the old paradigm which are, on which your machine learning models are very well in uh, in understanding so this knowledge infusion is basically a way where you can actually gap uh, you can actually bridge this gap between the domain uh, data and the concept class so there are different types of uh, knowledge infused learning uh, where we actually and these are like these are the categories that we came up with based, based on our uh, recent literature survey that we actually did. Uh, one was a shallow infusion and other is a semi deep infusion. And the third one is a deep infusion, which I will very briefly touch upon uh, in the shallow infusion. What essentially you are trying to do is there's no messing around with the uh, deep learning model. What you essentially try to do is you enrich your data set and you get some hypothesis, hypothetical information, which is uh, kind of a hypothesis uh, data distribution, which I wrote it as a tacit knowledge, which is basically a learned knowledge. And you try to find a similarity between what the external knowledge has and what the model has learned. So you can use a hypothesis testing or similarity based verifications. Moving on to the semi deep, here you actually mess around with the deep learning model. You actually uh, bring this self, uh, this uh, knowledge, extra knowledge into the machine learning uh, model or into the deep learning model as a form of an attention. So uh, when you uh, put the knowledge in as a form of an attention, this process generates a weight matrix, which I represent as a W. And what you essentially do is you have a weight matrix for the tacit knowledge or the learned knowledge, and you have a weight matrix learned by this thing, uh, by this self knowledge or self aware knowledge or external knowledge, and you try to find a similarity between these two domains, uh, these two uh, outputs. So what you're actually saying is that, that there is a weight that I, I generated based on my self-aware knowledge 
and there's a weight which is generated by the deep learning model which are kind of you can consider them to be a kind of a heat map kind of a kind of a m cross m a square matrix so you have two square matrices and you can actually create or you calculate a, a cosine similarity between or a similarity between those two matrices so that's very simple in a very simple sense you just want to verify how well your model learned your self aware uh, self aware external knowledge representations so uh moving on to uh the shallow infusion so uh, as i said in the shallow infusion part it is more like uh, improving a data so when i say improving a data is it happens through word embeddings word to vec which is a very popular extensively used method glove which is another variant of word to vec retrofitting is another method where you actually use a semantic lexicons as i said phu9 lexicon or dsf lexicon and you change the embeddings of word to vec or glove that's retrofitting fast text is another character level methods that have been also been used for improving the data sets counterfeiting is another way of very similar to retrofitting using the lexicons and the current trend in 2018 2019 which goes on to the transformers these are all ways of generating the embeddings of your data and how they do it is you can actually bring your knowledge base your existing knowledge or in kind of a relational database is a knowledge graph and you can concatenate them with the information uh, that's in your training data that way it enriches your training data or your input so you get better uh, representations and with better representation there's a possibility that your model will have a better precision and recall so these are like the ways in which you actually work around on your data set on your improving your input training data the semi deep infusion is the in that uh, the methods are basically more of forcing methods which is teacher forcing professor forcing neural attention models which are self attention and neural guided are uh, like uh, knowledge guided neural attentions lstms with knowledge graphs or knowledge base and knowledge based gans so these have been the recent uh, very few very specific work that act on uh, using the no uh, background knowledge in improving the classifications so this is a kind of a very visionary architecture of deep infusion or deep uh, infusion of knowledge that we thought about uh, as where we actually try to improve your uh, learning so essentially what it does in a very abstract sense is as follows when your model is training your deep learning model is training it is it is goes through a series of layer and each layer has some hidden hidden units and these hidden units have hidden representations but it has been stated in the past as well as in back propagation algorithm that there is information loss when the model is training over multiple layers this information loss can be yeah, can be actually regulated through a kind of a knowledge graph which is in parallel through a kind of a function which i which we which you can actually use in a very simple sense is a kullback labeler uh, labeler divergence which is kl divergence algorithm uh which are the uh, uh, kl divergence function which tries to uh, find the information loss between what's in the layer uh, hidden layer and what's there in the output uh, knowledge and that all you for now very simple sense you can actually replace this knowledge graph with your input data only so you want to just make sure that your your layer is not losing knowledge and it is retaining the knowledge where as it's training so that's another uh, that's actually a way where you can actually use uh, knowledge infusion and you can actually use and the output and with the knowledge graph it brings an explainability and interpretability in your outcomes so that you can explain oh this is the graph that i have and these are the nodes within the graph that were actually most visited while training that means that these are the words that are being most often touched upon by the model while it's learning let me see whether those models those those nodes are actually useful for for the uh, for the domain experts so that brings in the real uh 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 address a real way of addressing the issues of adoption of ai uh, in healthcare so uh, among all the uh, uh, different ways uh, in which the knowledge infused learning can be modeled uh, i will just give you a brief uh, uh, a few uh, models that i would search, I, I i myself have tested and they have actually worked well in terms of knowledge infusion one is basically the lstms which is the long short term memories so what i uh, what i essentially does is that uh, among various variants of lstms if you can see in deep learning uh, like for example there are many to many lstm where whatever inputs you have you have equal number of outputs and uh, which are very similar to an auto encoders uh, in this case what i have shown you in the figure is more of like a many to one lstm 
it learns through the sequence and it has one cumulative sequence at the very end and what essentially we are trying to do is we'll take that sequence and a sequence preceding that and some kind of a knowledge representation and pass it through a simple multilayer perceptron in this case the knowledge graph representation acts as a bias in training a multilayer perceptron to generate a new representation mt which is basically a knowledge that, which is basically a representation involving the training data as well as a knowledge graph so this is one way of uh, putting your knowledge infused learning another way where you, which i have not tested it but it should be interesting would be 1d convolutional neural network which can be used for mixing so right now I, what i have done is for multi layer perceptron you can replace a multi layer perceptron with one di one dimensional convolutional neural network for mixing purposes another version is to transform this entire architecture using a graph convolutional neural network uh, which exploits the hierarchical structure uh, this is very much important if if your application requires the uh, requires the uh, preservation of relationships between the entities while prediction so that's where your graph convolutional net neural network plays a key role another model that i have was very fascinated with uh, it came up with a, in a recent work uh, by dr chang at stanford university uh, which is uh, basically the knowledge guided generative adversarial network what essentially it does is that you have a training data of very of seen categories that means assume that this thing that you have uh, so uh, this their framework was actually built to understand uh, the uh, to understand the data of stroke patients uh, patients who have been stuff, uh, suffering from strokes and there are different way different variety uh, different uh, variants of stroke like ischemic strokes and uh, hemorrhagic strokes so in this what they essentially did was they have the data on the stroke patients suffering from ischemic stroke in the seen category data and they do not have the information on the hemorrhagic uh, stroke patients so what they essentially wanted to do is how well the model ident gives the treatment outcomes when they pass this unseen categories along with the seen categories and train a generative adversarial network that gives a prediction on for uh, the seen categories which is the ischemic stroke as well as the uh, hemorrhagic stroke without ha having a labeled data for the uh, hemorrhagic uh, stroke patients so essentially this entire architecture the the major uh, important part was the discriminator obviously it learns over the real and fake data what essentially it does is that it looks at the embedding regression network which is the which is kind of it takes the gen uh, parameters of the generator 1 and the parameter of generator 2 and uh, sharing of these parameters it does two predictions one prediction g1 and other is a prediction with g2 because there are those two are the two different uh, uh, generators that we have actually trained so you have three different laws and at the end what we essentially do is we actually look at the cosine similarity of the information loss using the kl divergence or using the cosine similarity as a function to the similarity between the two other so when i say prediction prediction is an embedding and prediction of g2 is also an embedding uh, prediction so what essentially you are doing is you are trying to find the difference between the embeddings that you have in your uh, uns uh, your semantic embedding of the unseen categories, which you can actually find from PubMed abstracts. You can look at for the knowledge graphs in you in the healthcare domain, and you find the difference between them using the KL divergence or cosine similarity. So essentially, the objective function of this entire architecture goes on to that you have the simple GAN, but over here you add this simple GAN with a regularizer. Which is where I say SE is basically semantic embedding of the uh, loss incurred by the generator one and the inc loss incurred by generator two. So this network actually tries to predict the uh, the severity of uh, hemorrhagic stroke patients based on the severity analysis of ischemic stroke patients. So this was a very interesting uh, uh, work on generating uh, using the generative adversarial network in healthcare domain. With all these architectures and models in place, what specific is a key takeaway that you can take away, you can uh, get from this work on knowledge infused learning? The major objective function that people have used is a KL uh, divergence, which is kill, a callback laborer divergence functions, which you, because it actually helps you to uh, measure the information loss, and it is insensitive to the distribution of your data, which makes it a very important um, uh, objective function. Knowledge graph embeddings can be developed from various approaches, such as whole he, whole I, and transi. Different models can be used 
uh, for knowledge infused learning, various short encoders, LSTMs, GANs, and CMA's neural networks. In terms of framework, you can actually model your problem as a zero shot learning, one shot learning, transfer learning, and parameter sharing, where the knowledge graph plays a key role. Other variants of an objective function that you can take, along with, uh, in spite of like uh, taking the Kullback uh, KL divergence, is Jensen divergence, which is just a variant of KL divergence. Regularization, as I said in the previous slide, regularization is another way you can actually bring in the knowledge. And integer linear programming, which is definitely a very nice way of bringing in constraint in your uh, data. In terms of evaluation, you what essentially you can actually look into when you're doing knowledge infused learning is before the knowledge infusion and after the knowledge infusion what exactly the model is doing there there are different methods one is a fresh uh, inception distance which is very popular in images but it can be it is also possible to use in the uh, textual data statistical significance hypothesis testing which is basically you have one representation from your training data one representation from a semantic uh, resource and you find the uh, uh, how well they align or how well they differ uh, where they differ how what is the information loss and can that information loss be added through a uh, concatenation or some dimensionality reduction technique applied after concatenating the those two uh, representations you can also report word and concept features uh, that the model is uh, is putting its emphasis and seeing whether that uh, model is those features are actually uh, important to the uh, domain expert. TSNA visualization of clusters, area under the perturbation curve, which is a pretty interesting topic. And I just uh, got to know in the, like in the, in the previous, uh, I think, couple of uh, days only, uh, which, which tells you that if uh, you have, like, say, 100 features, uh, if you remove 20 features out of it, the remaining 80 features, how will your model perform? So if you remove 40 features out of it, in the remaining features, how your model is performed. In this way, you can actually find which are the features which are actually important. And then you can have human and loop to test whether those uh, features are important or not. And of, above all, you can always go for human-centric evaluation, which is crowdsourcing, user satisfaction, mental models, and trust assessment and correctability, whether my results is correct or not. For correctability, you can actually go with Cohen's Kappa, which is one other annotator, inter-annotator agreement measures. In terms of applications, so we, we already covered the definition, we covered the methods, we covered the evaluation and matrix, and now we move to the applications of the knowledge infused learning. The applications, uh, there are a bunch of it. Uh, I will try I'll go over like a couple of them. Uh, one is the summarization process in the clinical diagnostic interviews. When a person, when a clinician is seeing a patient, Right? He has no clue about his mental health page, uh, his uh, concern, uh, his uh, status. And he starts with some initial interviews. The interview, as you can see on the top right, is basically the start of the interview, which is basically more casual, just random questions. Middle of the interview is very specific, asking very specific questions. And the end of the interview is also kind of very spe uh, specific, but it will be helpful if you can add it to the summarization stuff. So this entire structure, what it essentially does is that it... Uh, it takes it takes those conversations into account and find an area within that conversation which is very much informative for the clinician and summarize that part and it is give and that summary is given to the clinician for evaluation in this process uh, i what i have used is the integer linear programming as i said before it is a very fascinating uh, framework which allows you to optimize the things which you want to be uh, you want to optimize for example my summaries should have high linguistic quality and they should be informative that's in terms of uh, from, from the clinical perspective standpoint so that's what we optimize in the ilp summarization task in this process we pay focus on the terms which are very much important to the clinical uh, for the, to the clinician and how we do that is through a measure which we call as a word semantic scores, which we create using the PHU-9 lexicon and the ConceptNet vocabulary. The ConceptNet, as I said, is a general, general uh, vocabulary, which has hum large number of words. PHU-9 is very specific to the application. What we essentially we wanted to do is we want to give the weights to the terms which are very much important and give low scores to the terms which are not important for the summaries. And as you can see, an example of sad and insomnia, which are very much related to depression and uh, distress are way higher than the terms like lawyer and male, which are like not that much relevant, are giving low scores. 
uh, in the word semantic uh, score index. So that would help uh, the ILP method to actually do a better job in summarizing the interviews. And uh, when you look at the uh, visualization of how these things work, as you can see, the BERT, which is a very famous deep learning algorithm, is not able to understand what exactly happening in the conversations. And it takes the terms which he thinks with the model things basically is important. We move with an abstract summarization using integer linear programming with some constraints. As I said, the linguistic quality and uh, informativeness. Right now, we do not use uh, domain knowledge. But when we use domain knowledge, we get more concrete summaries. As you can see very uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, example, for example, the patient was asked how long ago were they diagnosed depression. Participants said they are still depressed, which is kind of not relevant as a response to the question being asked. Whereas when you say uh, on the using the PHQ-9, you say how long were they were diagnosed with depression? The participants said a year ago, which is basically kind of a more appropriate response to the question being asked. And there are many other questions which were which the model uh, without the knowledge ignored those questions and responses. Whereas the model which takes the knowledge gathered or captured those questions and responses. Another application where I where I actually used knowledge infused learning was to find an association between social media and electronic health records. In this process, what we did was we actually had the suicide watch subreddit data of 93,000 users and the New York City CDRN, which is the clinical data reserve network on the EHR uh, of for the electronic health records for 123,000 patients. We projected this on the TSNE class uh, visualization along these categories, depressive feelings, psychological disorders, drug abuse, and many other categories. And some similar categories were, uh, were there in the uh, social and the social media as well. And what we essentially wanted to see in this, which is a very concrete example of why the knowledge infused learning is required in healthcare, is that we identified self-harm, depressive feelings, and suicidal ideations as a latent topics expressed in reddit as well as in the ehr data and another thing we found was both the resources or both the sources did not provide evidence of mentions or expressions of impulsivity family violence and drug abuse so they were there but they were not actually uh, being shown in a very large sense in the in the data so that actually gives us the way of analyzing how social media needs to be used in EHR and how EHR can be benefited in understanding social media and vice versa. So you need to have this background knowledge, which we gather from SNOMED, CT, DataMed, ICD-10 as the major resource in understanding these behaviors. So with this in the mind, in the motivation in mind, we, we step into the knowledge infused learning for healthcare. I speak, I will be speaking around two specific things, challenges and the classification of Reddit post to DSM-5. So the first challenge is the contextualization and it happens at the user level across different. So in this uh, uh, contextualization process at the user level, assume that a user has posted at some, so the number that you can see S8 and S5, you consume that I have 15, sources of information and this uh, this user has posted in the fifth source and there's uh, this user has also posted in some eighth source and you can in a very if you want to kind of like a pedagogical example consider them to be subreddit so some like 15 forums where this person has shown his interest and gave him gave the post over there so if i take the post of this person let's say on the on the left hand side i don't think i have thought about it every day of my entire life and i have for good proportion of it however my boyfriend and whatever issues are there you take this post and you give the model and your model gives a prediction right the prediction is so the person is having some indication of suicide he may not commit suicide but he has some indication of suicide but what happens is that when i bring his another content in the past together right or it can be the content that he posted on the same day itself but in some other some other forum if I bring that content, I get a different representation because we are bringing the context. The context is basically the, the, the description that the user is giving uh, that the, basically the model is not aware of that initially, but if you can bring it, it's some additional information. It's kind of an additional uh, direction or pointers that will help the model make a very well wise judgment and not some kind of a random judgment which only uh, which is basically more fragile and brittle 
and is basically hinders its adoptions. So that's basically one challenge in uh, in healthcare is the contextualization. You want to bring as much context before you actually train your model, and that context needs to be very much similar to the uh, to the basically the, the the problem that you're actually trying trying to solve. For example, if the person is uh, having uh, is showing depression, so if you want to predict depression in it. Definitely, suicide-related content might be him uh, might be important. But if you bring the suicide content, then your model will not predict the depression severity, but rather it will predict the suicide severity. So you want to be very cautious in bringing the context. So that's the one biggest challenge in the healthcare. Uh, let me give you another example, another uh, challenge, which is uh, abstraction. So we abstraction always go along with the contextualization. So you wanted to do is. So contextualization, as I said in the previous one, uh, this is bringing the post uh, along with the uh, uh, the current post. You want to bring them together. What I have shown on the left hand side is a graph. Let's say I am talking about suicide watch subreddit, where people are talking extensively on suicide related terms and suicide related communications. What I see is stop self harm, which is I represent SSH uh, abbreviations of like the uh, the full form of all of these things are given at the very bottom. Stop self harm self-harm, borderline personality disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, addiction and depression and bipolarity has some contribution. This person has talked about in all these forums and whenever when his content, he he when he's talking in Suicide Watch subreddit, I could I could relate his conversation, the way he's conversing in the in the Suicide Watch with his conversation in other forums. And I wanted to bring that conversation over here so that I can have a valid, uh, a wise judgment a correct judgment about this person's uh, suicidality or suicide risk severity. So that's the way that's that's the whole job of contextualization. Moving further, we look at this user's content. I found myself mired in a similar situation as your boyfriend addicted to the internet. It sounds like he is hurting a lot and needs your help in changing its habit. We know that there is some addiction issues. There is some depression related content, but this is a, a, a clinician would take a time to actually understand and decipher what exactly the person is trying to do and maybe require multiple time, multiple iterations of it. So what essentially abstraction does is like transforming this content into keywords, into terms or concepts which are more relevant to the clinicians and they can make a wise uh, immediate judgment on what the person is talking about. Drug abuse, hyperactive behavior and depressive behavior, uh, mood. So these are the main uh, attributes that describe that patient. And with this in mind, you actually do uh, the model will do a better job in prediction. So that's the so transformation of this uh, very uh, absurd content into a more very specific content is what the job of abstraction is, and of which we you, we use with these kind of resources that you see in the QWERTL box. Now in this, so you have seen me talking about social media data and EHR data. Are is there a way to actually have uh, have a map between these two? Yes, there is a map. So if I can take a social media data in terms of like social media platform like Reddit, and I talk about uh, what I have seen you, which you have seen in the past, that I have talked about SNOMAD CT, ICD-10, DataMad, Twitter ADR, Drug Abuse Ontology, Ask a Patient, DSM-5 lexicon, and Suicide Risk Severity lexicons. These lexicons provide some very concrete information in the EHR data. So what you see in the green box is the electronic health records information electronic health records provide you the treatment information they give you observation drug related information they also provide mental health conditions and they also uh, provide your risk levels ideation be even attempt and these all informations can be gathered from these lexicons which gives you the power to actually bring the social media data with the ehr data and to actually understand the synergy between these two platforms and see how we can actually leverage the uh, these data through this knowledge graph and handle the data data sparsity problem and handle the ambiguity problem. Now, in this task for the knowledge or moving or mapping the Reddit to DSM-5, the classification of the Reddit content to the DSM-5 disorder, the task that I was and uh, very much uh, curious about was given my given me a content in a bipolar subreddit, how I can map that content to a DSM-5 category, which in this case is a depressive disorder. I do not make changes in the data set. I do not make change in the content of the user. I just change their labels. So essentially what the task transform into that I have, I have all these uh, subreddits, bipolar, bipolar SOS, depression, and what essentially these four subreddits 
are being mapped to the depressive disorder, the DSM-5 category. This is essentially what I want to do. And subsequently, addiction, crippling, alcoholism, opiates, recovery, opiates, self-harm and stop self-harm are being mapped to the substance use and addictive disorder. There's a possibility that self-stop, self-harm and self-harm also associate with suicidal ideations and behavior. But in just kind of an example sense, you can actually map them. They are also equivalently responsible for suicidal uh, substance abuse and addictive disorders, and which also further can associate with uh, suicide. So you can actually look at the trail blazing around with this mental health conditions, right? And you can actually have this chain, which you can actually exploit for better uh, understanding and explainability and better outcomes. So we know, uh, so just this is this slide is actually I made for people who, who might not be aware of Reddit. Uh, so Reddit is just a social media platform, uh, which talk, people talk about gives the main post, which actually starts a conversation. People give comments and then replies. We actually uh, scraped this content or we gathered this data from the period of 2005 to 2016 with 550K users, 8 million conversations and 15 mental health subreddits. So when I say 15 mental health subreddits, consider them to be 15 different forums, something very similar to what you can see in the figure in front of you. So in this, the crawling, uh, I just wanted also wanted to uh, 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 say out. Uh, da, so the, in the last talk in the pie data, which was given by Hui Zhang, uh, who talked about the beautiful soup and uh, uh, scraping of the social media content or scraping the web, something very similar which we used in uh, scraping the Reddit to actually uh, gather the data for different mental health subreddits. So that's kind of a, like a uh, very interesting uh, way of gathering your own data for your own prototypical understanding of, uh, of uh, how this data can be used for healthcare purposes. So when I say uh, Reddit to DSM-5 mapping, uh, I have, so essentially what I'm, I'll just be recollect. So you know, as I said, the task is that you have the data with a bipolar subreddit and you are being mapped to another content, which is basically the DSM-5, uh, uh, same content, but with the different labels, how we gonna do that. So that's the task in hand. So what essentially wanted to do is we have this data with Reddit post in the subreddit label. As I said, the previous example is a bipolar subreddit label as one example. We pass them through n-gram model, LDA and LDA, which is basically the latent Dirichlet allocation, which is basically a topic model in the natural language, natural language processing world. And what you want to do is you have this representation. As I said, always we create a representation, an embedding vector, a feature vector of any dimension that you feel uh, good. It depends and yeah. it's effective. You have two minutes. Yeah. So, and we create a normalized hit scores. Uh, this normalized hit score is basically the, the, the similarity between the representations and the n-grams and this representation of the subreddit and essentially what you want to create is basically uh, a red, or you replace the subreddit post with the DSM-5 label that is of the highest similarity with the representation what you see in the from the uh, n-grams LD and LD over by grams. So in this process, the workflow is as follows you see Reddit with DSM-5 labels that you created in the past, you pass into a word embedding model. You have this background knowledge. The reason I wanted to use it because they have been used in, in, uh, in uh, mapping the Reddit to DSM-5. So I need them to actually make sense of what how, whether the model is able to understand this mapping. So what essentially you're trying to do is you're trying to find a correlation between the words in the DI Reddit, correlation between what the DSM-5 concepts are and what essentially you want to do is a mapping from the Reddit to DSM-5. That is a cross correlation. And you want to optimize this process. And at the end, you, what you get is a vocabulary matrix, uh, which is a, a matrix between the words in the Reddit and the DSM-5 concepts. And you modulate your word embedding. Basically, you change the word embeddings, right, with these scores. And hence, you do the classification. And, and optionally, you can actually add linguistic features as well. So essentially, what you're trying to do in a very mathematical sense is that you have the Reddit words and you have the DSM-5 categories. Essentially, you want to learn this W in the middle and uh, you have different word embedding models which you can use and you actually try to learn this W and which is basically kind of a uh, optimization function between the Reddit and the DSM-5 which is represented by D and uh, for the, the first the part of that equation, uh, the first after the min W is the encoder and on the right after Delta is the decoder stage. So that's why we call it as a semantic encoding and decoding optimization. Uh, this is just a derivation of the semantic encoding decoding optimizations. 
So what happens is that with this approach, we are able to see that an existing up method, which complete de uh, dependent on the lexical and syntactic features, gave 30% false alarm rate. And with our approach, which uses this contextual feature with DSM-5 and DAO, uh, which we do, we, we do not even use linguistic features at all, we get 4.5% uh, false alarm rate. And it will go further down if you do linguistic features, but I doubt that because uh, it depends how uh, discriminative are those linguistic features. And it is completely data driven. So it brings in more uh, uh, explainability and uh, easy ease in your uh, methods because now you know how how the model performed well, when which were, which are the specific words that the model perform, uh, used in its prediction. So uh, to end my talk, I just wanted to actually give you a, a series of resources which uh, I uh, which I have used and I have even built by, uh, with my collaborators uh, over this time, particularly to understand how the knowledge infused learning can be used in understanding uh, healthcare and making systems which are more close to its adoption in the real world. Uh, so to end the talk, finally, uh, we I just want to summarize. Where are we and what's happening in the world right now? So as I said, uh, the current research focuses on background knowledge, focusing on shallow infusion and semi-deep infusion. Explainable AI in healthcare falls short in the involvement of medical knowledge graphs. Uh, that's another challenging area where you can explore. Intelligent virtual assistants. User engagement is a huge challenge and knowledge infused learning is a step towards it to solve those challenges. It requires a personalized health knowledge graph, which is a kind of a, like a, a, an exploratory world or domain right now in the knowledge graph and the motivational interviewing, which is another ex exciting area of research in healthcare, which improves your chatbot experience. And apart from this, the knowledge infused learning in healthcare, I would say KIL healthcare plus X where X opens its, uh, its uh, domain to autonomous driving vehicles, cyber training threats, disaster resilience systems, and personal finance. So these are the four main areas I would I would urge you to explore with the knowledge-infused learning. On the right is just a Gartner uh, hype curve, which tells you that the knowledge graph is just stepping its its foot in the world for uh, for uh, motivating the uh, the researchers to actually exploit this knowledge graph, the semantic knowledge in improving and propelling the deep learning models. And anything above the knowledge graph is something that you can actually use them, use knowledge graph in those to actually improve their performances and make more sense of your outcome. And rather than simply sticking around with precision recall in ESCO. With this, I give my acknowledgement to all the collaborators with whom I worked, uh, my advisor on the left, uh, my co-advisor, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Prasad, Dr. Shalin, Dr. Patak, and my colleague, uh, Or. With this, uh, thank you all. Uh, I wish uh, you all the best. So uh, uh, this, uh, the Knowledge Infused Learning, we actually are organizing a workshop at the KDD conference this year, uh, which is uh, the, the submission are still on. And you can actually also look at other research where uh, we, I am actually, and together my collaborators are extensively involved in the Artificial Intelligence Institute at the University of South Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Manas. Um, you have the honor of being the longest talk in PyData Salamanca. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you, you so much. It, it, was, it was a nice talk. We really appreciate it. And um, usually what we do here is we wait if someone who is watching wants to ask a question, uh, okay. he can just use the chat. Okay. But I know there's someone who is already connected who wants to ask you a question. So, uh, Marcos, you can, you can join and, and ask the, the question you wanted to ask to Manas directly. Uh, yes. Hello, Manas. Uh, my question was uh, about the probability of an of a PAC learning mm -hmm. uh, in how to transform these monotonicity problems to more non-monotonic problems. For example, uh, how can we classify robustness and consistency mm -hmm. in order to know if if our domain is correct? Is for example. Uh, in in a check for hypothesis mm -hmm. to know if if our 
null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis mm -hmm. uh, in which if we are in the in the region of confidence uh, how can we do that uh, from from these domains okay so uh, marcos if i understood uh, correctly your question is about that you have a, a problem at, at hand and which is basically a non monotonic problem and you want to convert the non monotonic problem into a monotonic problem for better and enhanced classification am i right uh, it was the, the other way around because in this case uh, we are in high monotonic uh, very high monotonic domains mm -hmm. as if you are uh, looking for some of the context on on your on your data mm -hmm. uh, if if they are mental health related yes uh, probably they are uh, sending you in this domain mm -hmm. they will send you to to very high monotonic responses mm -hmm. and will lead lead us to to a hypothesis but how oh, to right, keep right, right. this robustness yes. because for example if if it is if it is a fiction if it is a um, a fiction context Mm -hmm. uh, probably the same the same mm, language the same semantics uh, used there the yes. will will lead us to to erroneous hypothesis and we will need to to check to pick the the alternative hypothesis in in our statistic inference inference absolutely absolutely so um, uh, one thing is that uh, marcos is Suppose you have a, uh, a data with you, or, uh, you have a data set. Uh, uh, so essentially what uh, you wanted to do is you want to add some delta noise uh, in your data set. So while you're training your model, right? While, while you're actually building your data uh, artificial intelligence model, it's always, uh, test, it's always nice to test with some random noise. If you add some random noise to your model, then it will be able to understand that how much diversity you can handle and how much diversity in the responses is possible. For example, I'm just giving an example right now in front of, uh, if you can see my screen. So this is like about the generative adversarial network. So what essentially this model does is that you have the same category data, assume that to be, let's say, uh, it's, it has some information and you know about those information. You add some noise, the Z1 is the noise that you add so that the model can be able to uh, adapt itself with some noise in the data set. And there's something very similar as you, what you can do is something that you are not seeing, and that you are more, you're, and you want a consistent prediction with that. You actually have those uh, that kind of structure as well in Z two, and you are essentially trying to train two models, which are actually one is learning about the things that you are aware of, which you can say can be like non monotonic or monotonic. Another thing will be the opposite of it. And what essentially you want to your model is trying to do is you're trying your model is trying to di uh, differentiate between those two and tries to see that to what level of significance can you predict very close to what you already know. So it, that that will actually bring in some diversity in your prediction, but it will not also lose the monotonicity in your prediction. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have another question in the audience. So the SAI uh, ask uh, exactly in place of war embeddings, is it possible that we use sense tense embeddings? What will be the effect on outcome in terms of chat applications, for example? Sense dense embedding, right? Uh, sentence embedding. Okay, okay, okay. Sentence embedding. Uh, yeah. So uh, the selection of word embedding or sentence embedding all depends upon the uh, the type of applications uh, for which the chatbot has been made. Suppose I would uh, uh, I would say that it's kind of an experiment experimenting thing. Uh, you can actually go with word level embedding. You can also go with sentence level embedding. But it depends upon uh, your applications. For example, if I have a chatbot which actually asks, uh, in which you are uh, you are allowing the user to give a long detailed responses, definitely sentence level embedding would be better. But if the responses are very short. I would say to go for word level embedding or even if the word, if the sentence, if the expression, if the input is way shorter, then I would say even you, you can even try the character level embedding. So it depends upon the type of input you're getting on the chatbot. Okay. I think uh, we are past eight here. It's a little bit late. So thank you very much, Mana. It was a, a so pleasure. Much. 
and you know we are going to talk uh, about all the stuff uh, later but yes. just about this talk it was yes. perfect thank you very much thank you so thank much you. thank you everyone attending bye bye